So we hear time and time again. There are two sides to every story. We're told this over and over. What if there's more than two sides, three sides, four sides, five sides? It's 1.30am and there is a knock on the door. At first he's not sure that he has heard it correctly. Was it the wind? Was it an animal brushing past the house? Then it happens again and the knock is more frantic. This time he goes to the door and he sees a female and she's asking for help. Before he can do anything, she runs into his house. She runs past him, up the stairs. She runs into a bedroom and between a bed and a wardrobe, she curls herself up into a tiny, tiny ball. He has no clue what to do. Before he even has a second to think about it, another female marches past him. She goes straight up the stairs and she gets that first female who's hiding upstairs and she marches her downstairs. She mumbles her apologies for the disturbance. She says, I'm sorry that she's come round to your house at this hour and I'm sorry that she ran into one of your bedrooms. Is this the last time that this man is ever going to think about this or is this the last time he's ever going to have any dealings with these two females? No. There's two sides to every story. What if one of those sides is ab? Absolutely horrific. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Hey, how are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. I am. I'm well. Thanks for asking. <laughs> yes, I'm good. Uh, yes, all's going quite well in uh, Extraordinary Studies podcast land. <laughs> all is good. The merchandise is out there and it's doing well and lots of you are getting in touch with your pictures of you wearing the merchandise or holding the merchandise and it's just lovely. It's nice. It's nice for me to see. Thank you for your hilarious and <laughs> insightful comments on the last episode, the Yasmaheen and Breatharianism episodes. So lots of Lots of amazing and very, um, yeah, people just not really mincing how they feel about her. Some great comments were just like, f- you know, fuck her, which I thought was like, okay, <laughs> brilliant. Some just like brilliant, hilarious comments, loving it. Hashtag, who eats half a chocolate biscuit? Made me laugh a lot. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> um, yeah, good. So, I will warn you, this story, it's a change of pace, as is my want with this podcast to constantly mix it up. And there are elements of this story that are not nice. So, 
this is your warning. I'm telling you now. There's stuff in it that's not nice. All right, I'm going to do a couple of quick shout outs and then I'm going to get on with the story. So hello to Abby Clare. Abby, thank you for getting in touch with me. Um, You sent me a really lovely message. Really nice to hear from you. Abby sort of said something that I I do think is quite interesting because I get this feedback quite a lot. She said, oh, I'd heard about like Extraordinary Stories podcast and heard your promo and whatever. And when I started listening, I was like, oh, this guy kind of wanders off the point sometimes. And, you know, it's not just factual and it's not just telling of the story. But luckily, Abby, you stuck with it. And now you enjoy the podcast. So that's great. Welcome to the Extraordinary Stories podcast world. I hope that you enjoy that. But yeah, I get that feedback a lot from people who, and I get this, I really, really get this. I like podcasts like um, Case File. I like things like, well, you know the kind of thing I mean, that's just like straight storytelling. And I understand that as a podcast listener, sometimes you don't want to hear somebody going off the point and telling you a ridiculous side story sometimes you do that's the thing and I just think you have to make your way as a podcast listener through that so and I I get that a lot of people will listen to an episode of this and they'll go it's not for me because the guy just gets a wee bit wandery sometimes and tells all these jokes and thinks he's hilarious and he's not really but um (laughs) and that but that but that's part of it so Abby hello that was a very long-winded way to say hello all right and shout out to Casey Lynn hello how are you now you've had quite the journey you've been traveling to Florida in your car with your two-year-old son your dog and your cat sounds like quite the handful going on there and you had a little breakdown in South Carolina, so, you know, sounds like that trip's going really well. <laughs> anyway, I hope you got to Florida, where you needed to be. And, uh, yeah, thank you for listening to the podcast. So, hello to you. And to Kendall McKeegan. McKeegan? 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 Well, I don't really know how, but one of those is hopefully in the right area. But anyway, Kendall, you graduated from college after a tough time and you know what well done to you well bloody done well done kendall good on you all right on with the story i warned you it's bumpy it's rough it's tough are you ready okay let's go We all know and understand what it is now to have a private life and a public life. And this is something in 2019 that we all have. Because, you know, if you think back years ago, that was a bit of an alien concept. You just, you you lived your life and people knew certain things about you. They knew your family. They knew what you did for your job. These days, social media has entirely changed that. So we're all now entitled to a public life and a private life. And whilst this story isn't about social media, social media plays a bit of a part in the story. And this idea of what's a public life and what's a private life and what are you sending out there to people is a really interesting idea in this story. So you know we all kind of we all kind of get that slightly, don't we? We can all pick and choose the pictures, the things that we put up there, <laughs> the things that we, you know, we monitor. I literally heard a friend of mine the other day saying, I just caught the tail end of the conversation. She went, no, I made her take them all down because I was worried she would put them on Facebook. And I was like, made, made her take, what? What are you talking about? And she was like, oh God, I was at a party the other night and my friend was just like obsessed with taking pictures. I looked awful, I was really drunk, and I knew that they would end up all over Facebook, so I just said to her, I, you need to get rid of all the photographs, you can't show them, I don't want anybody seeing them. But 
it's that that I'm talking about. It's that choice. It's this kind of idea of we can put out what we want to put out. So, you know, you over there with your Facebook and you with your Twitter and <laughs> you with your Instagram. We pick, we choose. We essentially curate what we want people to see. So when Jen Hart, an American woman, uses Facebook to document her family life and to show the sheer happiness of her life with her kids and her partner, she becomes the perfect example of how we sell ourselves. Jane Hart comes from, I think you say it, Huron, Huron, and it's in South Dakota. It gets described as a prairie town of about 14,000 people. So not, you know, not massive, like not, not massive. So, Jen, she grows up with her family, her mum, her dad, her brother. And now here's the thing. I don't want to say about Jen that she was unremarkable. I would hate to say that about any human being. (laughs) That's a terrible thing. I'm sure in lots of ways, you know, she growing up impacted on people's lives. But there's not really much to report in her childhood is what I'm saying. There's not really a great deal there that you can sort of like dig into and go, oh, that was interesting or this really shaped her character. There's just not an awful lot there. Her later life, yes. Her childhood, not so much. So she studied elementary education. And it's while she was studying that she met Sarah Gengler. And that was around about 2001. So in about 2001, Jen is studying and on the same course is Sarah Gengler. So they're both studying and this is in Minnesota. And they develop a very, very good friendship. So they're on the same course, they're in the same classes, they get to know each other, start going out, having a few wee drinks here and there, friends, lovely. And it very quickly develops into something much, much more. Jen and Sarah were, (laughs) well, (laughs) how to put it? Well, before too long, they were doing the (laughs) horizontal, I can't even say it properly, horizontal tangle of passion. (laughs) The two of them, they just very quickly fell head over heels in love with each other. So they began to date, they began to spend all their time together and they really became very, very dedicated to each other quite quickly. They moved in together quite fast and in 2004 they moved away from where they had been studying and they still living in the Minnesota area, they lived in Alexandria now. What did these two women want to do with their lives? Well, more than anything, more than absolutely anything, they wanted kids. They wanted to raise a family. They wanted a big family that they could have that would be their own. And so they started to go down the road of, right, well, how do we do that? What's the what's the steps that we need to take? What is the journey we need to go on? Now, you're looking at two sort of different things there. So you're looking at fostering as an option. You're looking at adoption as an option. I don't know if it's never been documented whether or not either of them ever thought about possibly conceiving using a sperm donor I don't know that that was ever really in their plans what they seemed to want to do was to foster and to adopt and I think part of that might have come from the fact that they were both described as people who really loved kids and would you know do their best to try and help kids who weren't in good family homes who weren't in good positions so maybe they were coming at it from the place of actually it would be better for us to 
adopt and foster kids who need it rather than us go through the whole sperm donor situation. So, now here's the thing, two things, two things to say here. Obviously, fostering and adoption, it's not going to be easy for Jane and Sarah. They're going to have to work really really hard. They're going to have to go through that really grueling process. You know, the grueling process that any couple wanting to adopt or wanting to foster has to go through. Now, what can make that even more difficult? And this just makes me insane to have to say it. In 2019, what can actually make that even more difficult is the fact that they are a same-sex couple. It's terrible, it's horrible to say it, but in 2019, see within fostering and adoption and that whole world, whether you're in the US, whether you're in the UK, doesn't matter where you are, heteronormativity still gets privilege. And that's still viewed as it, as the mainstream way of life. So as well as just having to go through the very lengthy process, they also had that to factor in to their decision. Second thing to say, I would love to adopt kids, right? I would love to adopt two kids, two girls. And <laughs> I've already decided what I would call them. <laughs> I'd call one Kylie and I'd call one Danny. <laughs> And their middle names would be Minogue, <laughs> and their surname, obviously, Henderson. So, I mean, I think that would be fabulous, wouldn't it? Well, that'd be brilliant <laughs> if you had little Kylie Minogue Henderson running around. I mean, that would be bloody brilliant, wouldn't it? <laughs> In all <laughs> seriousness, jokes aside, the process begins for Jen and Sarah, and after a while, they are given a 15-year-old girl who they foster on a temporary basis. And really, this is just to see if the fit is right. You know, might they adopt her? Let's just see how it goes. So, the 15-year-old girl, she comes and she lives with Jen and Sarah. And she's with them for a good few months. And by all reports, it's going fine. So, you know, nothing really seems to be going wrong. It seems that the girl's fitting in quite well. They seem quite happy. And then something very, very odd happens. Jen and Sarah drop the 15-year-old girl, the one that they've been looking after for months, off at a therapist appointment that they had booked for her. And at the end of that appointment, she's expecting them to come back and collect her. But they don't. The girl is informed, they won't be coming back for you. It just wasn't the right fit. Ugh. Gutting. That's fucking... Brutal. That's awful. I mean, that's a horrendously cold way to deal with that situation. So that 15-year-old girl, she's returned back to foster services because at the end of that appointment that she thought she was going to, where her two mums were going to come and collect her at the end of it, they're not there. They're not there to collect her. So, why did that happen? Why did they leave the 15-year-old behind? I mean, all they wanted was a family, so... Well, it's because they had been working with the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services and it was looking as if they were going to get some kids pretty soon. And what they realised is actually they would rather have these kids than this 15-year-old. Now, straight away, perhaps Americans, you might be going, 
mm, that's weird. They're in Minnesota. Why are they working with the Texas Department? Now, I checked this out. Actually, out-of-state adoption can happen. I didn't really know that that was a thing that you could do, but turns out that you can, even though they weren't in Texas. Turns out you can actually use another state's adoption services, and this is exactly what they have been doing. So the time comes and they're told, you can adopt. So there are kids ready to go. And now Jen and Sarah, who have become Jen and Sarah Hart, because Sarah has taken Jen's surname, are given three siblings on a long-term foster basis. Now, these three kids have sadly been removed from their mother. Their mum had a, a drug dependency and the kids have been removed from the family. So, they get Marcus, Abigail and Hannah and these become Jen and Sarah Hart's three children. Marcus is seven, Hannah is four, and Abigail is two. Now, as you can imagine, these kids, they're quite fragile, right? They've been removed from their family home, which might not have been the most stable of family homes. I mean, that's obviously speculation, but their mother was drug dependent so they've been taken out of that situation for a while they've been sitting in this kind of like place where they didn't really have a home and now here are Jane and Sarah Hart now there's something really massive to point out here the three kids that Jane and Sarah have been given are all black and Jen and Sarah are white and I only raise this because it will become a part of what happens later but also because at the time they were living in this bit of Minnesota called Alexandria which was predominantly white and they said that from the day these three kids arrived in their lives, they were getting funny looks from people. They were receiving these funny looks that these two white women were raising three black kids. So the very first night that these three siblings live with Jane and Sarah, Jen takes to Facebook, and this is something we will see her do all the way through this story. She takes to Facebook and she describes what that first night is like and pretty much she says it was awful. She says it was just horrendous. She describes that like the two-year-old Abigail just is peeing everywhere. She's just peeing all over the house everywhere. She says that the four-year-old Hannah is just eating all all the food that she can find anywhere. She's just stuffing all the food in her mouth. And she says that the seven-year-old Marcus is talking to himself in funny voices. She says, it's been eventful, but we need to do this. We are good people and we want to look after these kids. So, as I said, this is 2006 and for the next three years, the hearts go through a formal adoption process to become the actual parents, the actual proper guardians of these three children. So meanwhile, as that process is happening and the three kids are settling into life with Jane and Sarah, the, the kids go to nearby school, nursery, and they try to sort of settle in. Neighbours of the heart who live round about them will say, you didn't really see the family that much. 
You never really saw them go in and out of the house. They'll note quite interestingly that you very rarely saw Jen. They'll say you more saw like Sarah going to work and coming back from work, but you very rarely saw Jen. However, that's just what the neighbours were saying. On social media, Jen was ever present. She was posting pictures of the kids day and night. You know, it was just like loads of photos of like the kids smiling, the kids like playing a game, the kids like, you know, doing an activity outdoors. You know, she was very much like doing this kind of like look at look at these three brilliant happy kids that I'm raising. I've taken them out of that devastating place that they were living in and now I've given them this happy life. They also do this like Jen and Sarah are very into doing like the peace sign. The you know, think like, you know, John Lennon <laughs> peace sign kind of thing. Um you know the kids are always doing the peace sign in a photograph. So not really finished with just wanting three kids. They wanted more. They wanted a bigger and bigger family. They wanted the Jen and Sarah Hart. They just wanted more kids in their home. So they go back to the same Texas organisation who gave them these three siblings in the first place and they request another set of siblings to join the family. They say, we can we can take more kids, we want more. And so the wheels are put in motion for the Hart family to receive even more kids. Hannah, who is aged six, and under the care of Jen and Sarah, is at school one day when a teacher notices a bruise on Hannah's arm and it's a nasty bruise a really horrible nasty bruise on the six year old's arm and the teacher says how did you get that bruise? and Hannah says My mum, Jen, gave me the bruise for being badly behaved. Hannah says to the teacher, They hit us. What do you mean? The teacher asks. Hannah says again, They hit us. Mum, Jen, whipped me with a belt. So this teacher, very, very concerned, as you fucking would be, of course you would be, calls police and police come to the school and child services come to the school and they speak to Hannah and they ask her, "Just, just tell us again how you got that bruise and she says, Mum Jen hit me. They hit us all the time. They hit us with belts. They attack us. This is what they do. And so of the three siblings, another of the siblings is interviewed and says same thing. Exactly what Hannah has said. They hit us at home all the time. Now, police, with this information, they go straight to Jane and Sarah and they are shocked by these allegations. They say, look, the kids are making this up. This is not true. They are... I mean, essentially what they are trying to say is, look, they're rough and tumble kids. They're always like, you know bloody climbing trees or they're like running up and down the yard or they're like 
out there and they're just like, you know, like falling over things, they're on skateboards, they're on, they're doing all this sort of stuff. That's where the bruises came from. You know, that's where the bruise on her arm came from. Then Jen suddenly remembers that Hannah, with the bruise, actually fell down the stairs. And she says, I actually think that's where it came from. I think it came from her falling down the stairs, not from anything else. That's just, that's just ridiculous. That's just silly. Now, just to go back a step, I wasn't just telling you that the neighbour never saw the kids outside of the house because it was, you know, a piece of information. The reason I was telling you that is because it doesn't match with what these two are saying. If they're trying to say, oh, the kids are rough and tumble, they're up and down trees all the time, they're forever running up and down the garden, doing all these things, well, why then do the neighbours never see the kids outside of the house? Police decide that no charges can really be brought against Jen or Sarah. And the main police officer says something frustratingly as ambivalent as this. He says, kids get bruises all the time. It doesn't mean they're being beaten. Two months after this incident, the three kids are pulled out of school. They're to be homeschooled by Jen. This lasts about a week and they are taken back to school because one of the conditions of the adoption agency is that they remain in school. Which is, of course, as you would assume, the right fucking thing to do. Of course it is. Yeah. No, an adoption agency is not going to be like, yeah, yeah, here's some kids. Do you know what to do? Just take them and homeschool them. No, no, um, no person ever has to like really ever have an extra eye on them or check that things are okay. Yeah, 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 whatever. I don't know what the fuck Jen and Sarah Hart were thinking pulling them out of school. But yeah, that's what they tried to do. But no, the kids are very quickly back in school. So it's been a bit of a difficult time for the Hart family. You know, police around talking to them, they are saying, oh, it's just a big misunderstanding. Now, is this going to get in the way of them adopting more kids? Or, you know, what does it mean for them? Well, the answer is no. It is not going to get in the way of them adopting more kids. Because in 2009, and this is three years after their first adoption, they are given another set of siblings to take into their home. And that now takes the number of kids up to six in the Hart family. Again, these three siblings, they've been taken from a mother who had a substance abuse issue. And they've been given these three kids by that same Texas authority. So now, into their family, they welcome Devonte, Sierra, and Jeremiah. The other thing to mention that is familiar is that the other thing to mention is that these three kids are also black. So now, you have Jen and Sarah Hart, two white women raising six black kids. So, it's 2009, and they're now, well, they're now a family of eight. So there's now eight people living in that house, and the they just they just have to try and work as an eight, essentially. That's what they have to do. You know, Jen and Sarah have gone from having three kids to now having six kids. And, you know, they have to get them into schools. They have to organise everything. And that's, you know, that's fine. And I was sort of thinking to myself at this point, oh my God, like, you know, actually just 
<laughs> aside from the raising side of things, right, the actual day-to-day -day of what that means, feeding six kids, my God, that's a lot of, like, money. That's a lot of, like, stuff. And I was thinking, well, maybe, right, they have a lot of money, but they don't. They don't really have an, a great deal of money. So then I was like, what, like, what's their actual work life here? So, Sarah, she is the assistant manager for a skincare shop in the local area. So, I mean, I'm only guessing here, right? I don't mean to, you know, I'm, I could be wrong. I, d I don't think she's going to be earning a massive amount on that. But then, when I did some digging, I discovered that actually, the Harps were receiving around $30,000 a year in payment from adoption services. I mean, essentially, it's, you know, it's like if you, if you adopt kids, you, you know, you get a sort of like allowance or, you, you know, you get sort of money given to you. So $30,000 a year is given to them for the raising of their kids. Now, within the two of them, only Sarah worked. Jen didn't work. She stayed at home. She was the one who stayed at home and was the mother figure for the family during the day while Sarah went to work. Jen, as I've said, she was the big Facebook poster. She was the big Facebook user, always posting images of the kids. Let's look a little closer at some of these pictures that are coming up. A photo that Jen takes from, like, it's like she's taken it from above. It's like, yeah. So there's there's three of the kids that are on the floor and there's loads of new, as it's in the kitchen of their house. There's loads of newspaper on the floor and there's tins of paint everywhere. Each of the kids has a canvas and they're like painting madly all over the place. You know, the way that kids do. They'll like, you know, like, can throw a paintbrush about or like, you know, <laughs> yeah, just like put a paintbrush in their hair or whatever. They're just like, you know, paintbrushing all over the place. Now, each of the kids in the picture, they're wearing either a bandana or like a headscarf and to, to protect their clothing, they don't have any tops on. They're just wearing shorts. So it's a messy kind of like fun kids painting thing. Jen writes on the Facebook page something along the lines of, oh, you can't beat cranking up good music, stripping off and painting. Look at the mini Jackson Pollocks in the kitchen. Now, she puts this post up and it gets hundreds of likes and hundreds of comments. And people are like, woohoo. Your house looks so fun. Ha ha. Hope you enjoy cleaning up the mess. What a mum you are. I mean, kids should get messy. You know, it's fun. It's part of being a kid, isn't it? My uh, my mum likes to tell the story of when I was about three uh, she <laughs> walked into the kitchen and I had, obviously my curious three-year-old mind was like, oh, there's a cupboard it probably shouldn't go into. I wonder what's in this cupboard. And I went into it and I found a tub of um, <laughs> shoe polish. Yeah, so like a little tub of shoe polish, which actually for a three-year-old's hands is quite hard to open. Anyway, however, I managed to open this and obviously it was like, oh, what is that? That is shoe polish. So then I started to eat the shoe polish and I was like, oh, this is brilliant. So I was eating lots of lovely shoe polish. It was great. Then I decided, I was bored of eating it. So then I was like, took, took some of my hands and I was like, great, brilliant. And then I just like put it all over the kitchen walls and I was like, excellent, right, great. I'm just going to put some of my hair and then I'm just going to put some of all my clothes and I'm just going to put it absolutely everywhere. And my mum mom walked into the kitchen and she was like, Ma, what the fuck is happening? What's going on? 
<laughs> Why does it look like a murder scene? <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> There's stuff everywhere. Yeah, so, but you know, kids will be kids. You'll get into what you get into. So, this is the picture that Jen Hart has put up. She said, look at my kids having the greatest time. They're just having so much fun. Their six-year-old daughter, Abigail, is beginning to behave oddly at school. She's starting to ask classmates for food. When she thinks that no one is watching, she's stealing food from other people's bags. Teachers are paying really close attention to Abigail and they start to notice bruising on her body. Now, it's been three years since these same teachers saw Hannah with the bruise on her arm and now it's Abigail, her younger sister. And when they properly look at Abigail, they realise that her whole back and her stomach are covered in bruises. The school decide they're going to have to call the heart children in one by one and individually question them. And when they do, they hear the same from every single heart child. They say, they don't feed us. They hit us all the time. We're grounded all the time. We're constantly punished. The same day that these interviews take place with the Hart children, Jen Hart posts on Facebook a photograph of her six kids sitting on a wall on a bright sunny day and they've all got massive smiles looking at the camera. And she writes, love is everywhere. The love in this family is too much. We teach our kids to share and to spread the love wherever they go. Meanwhile, her kids are sitting being questioned about abuse. Police arrive at the Hart home and they want to talk about the bruises on Abigail's body. Now, this time, unlike last time, there's not really a way that they can excuse this, like, oh, it was a fall down the stairs, or it was a... fell from climbing a tree. You know, she's got, like, severe bruising across her back. In her stomach and they have to sort of show an ownership of that. Now, Abigail has been saying to police and to school teachers, it's my mum Jen, she's the one who hits us. She once ran my head under cold water and then knocked my face off the wall. But when police sit down to interview Jane and Sarah, it's Sarah who takes the blame. Sarah says, I was the one who hit Abigail. She says her behaviour was out of control and I lost it and I hit her. Sarah is fined 
$300 and she's given a year's suspended sentence. Now what's dead interesting is, right, see the main detective who was looking at this. He's asked, do you believe that it was Sarah? Or do you actually think it was Jen? And her partner was just taking the fall for it. And the detective says, and this just drives me insane. (laughs) It drives me insane. He says, well, I mean, in this situation like this, the one who says that they did the beating, I have to just take their word for it. Because I've not got time to investigate if it might have been someone else. Okay, great, wonderful, excellent. So, Sarah's the one here who's in the frame. She's the one who it looks like is abusing the kids. So, Jen, after this, is on Facebook a lot. And she starts to talk about how hard it is raising black kids when you are white parents. She says, this neighbourhood is so intolerant. No one understands what we're going through. We're two lesbian women. We're trying to raise these kids and all we come up against is horrific behaviour all the time. Is that true? No one knows. Of their six kids, they have Devontae. Devontae was 15, so he was like the second eldest of the children. And it's said that Devontae was very much known to be the favourite of Jen and Sarah. And that is really important to remember. Really important to remember that Devontae was the favourite for what happens later in the story. Also, small side note, how amazing is the name (laughs) Devontae Hart? Oh my God, it's bloody brilliant. Hello, I'm Devontae Hart. I just think that sounds great. It's pure, it's musical theatred out of its face, but it's great, isn't it? Deva- it's pure, hi, tonight, welcome to the Devante Hard Show. Yeah, it just totally sounds like a name that you should you know. Anyway, sorry, I've got sidetracked. Uh, so, yes, so Devante. Yes, Devante was the one that everyone went, oh, Jen and Sarah, they seem to really favour him over everybody else. Now, here's what happens. They say, that Devonte has apparently been called a racist name at school and that that is enough for them. They have to leave where they're living. They have to leave this bit of Minnesota. They've just got to go. Skeptics would say, well, it's opportune that you've just come under fire for the fact that your kids have got bruises and are claiming abuse that you now suddenly feel you need to move but okay so they move and they move to Oregon they start a new life a fresh way of living Jen, of course, is letting everyone know how the new life is via social media. And there's loads of pictures of the kids and they're smiling and, like, she's got them, like, smiling next to, like, a fridge full of food. So there's, like, all this kind of food. And then she's got them, like, big bowls of pasta sitting on a table. And she's, like, got the kids smiling next to it. So she's very much trying to just be like, you know, like, let's put all that nonsense behind us. She's got them, like, walking along the beach hand in hand, and they're, like, all joined in hands, and they look like a little rock band. (laughs) That's what they look like. They look like a little rock band. So they're in a new state. They get enrolled in a new school, and almost straight away, strange behaviours are picked up on. The stealing of food 
begins to happen again. And Jane and Sarah get a call from the school and the school say, look, there seems to be a bit of a problem here. Jen and Sarah say, look, you don't understand the situation here, okay? We've adopted, and this will become, I'm telling you this because this is important, this will become their line with everything. You don't understand this because we've adopted six kids who came from drug-addicted parents. Nobody understands them like we do. So, the stealing of food, all of these things, they're all to be excused because these kids have had a really hard life and we're the ones who are putting it right. Hmm. Okay. Issues with that. Many issues. Knowing that they are not allowed to do this, they pull the kids out of school and they decide... Homeschooling is the way forward. No more will will there be interfering schools. They just don't want these bloody interfering schools anymore. No, homeschooling all the way. They're not really allowed to do this. They're not. But here's Jen. She's on Facebook. And it's photos of the kids and they're reading books by the river. They're walking in a forest with a notebook looking at flowers taking notes and she's writing homeschooling heart style this is how the heart family do it this is how you raise your kids there's a really important person to bring into the story at this point and it's a friend of jen and sarah's now her name has never been released she has chosen to stay anonymous and I can completely understand why. She'd known Jen and Sarah long before they had kids and she'd known them when they first adopted after the first couple of years and then she hadn't seen them for a little while and then she came back into their life. When she spoke about them later She says, Jen ran her home with almost military style precision. The kids were ignored continually, except Devonte. There was always time for Devonte. This is really sad. She says, the kids were like robots. Now when she's talking about this, years later, she's asked, yeah, but what about all those social media pictures? What about all the pictures we saw of them having fun and doing all those things? She says, Jen forced the kids into those pictures. Those pictures where they look full of life and full of joy. The truth is, these were joyless and sad kids and she made them pose for photographs. Remember that photo of them all painting that I described earlier on? The friend points out something really interesting in that photograph she says if you look closer what you'll actually see is these kids have got their ribs sticking out of their chest how come you can see their ribs sticking through their stomach she says if she ever questioned jen about the kids weight jen would say oh they're just all bean poles They'll fill out in time, don't worry. They're just, they're skinny because they're just skinny kids. That's, that's, that's what they are. Okay, so they're living in Oregon. They keep themselves to themselves. The kids aren't in school. There's no school involvement. They can really do what they want. So now here's the bloody thing. (laughs) 
if Jen loves a photo, and we know that she does, well, this is about to be her greatest moment. Jen and Sarah take the kids to a Black Lives Matter rally. A really important, important event. There should be more of them. I want more of them. So let's make them happen even more. Now, the reason that this particular one is happening in Oregon is that a young black man who was unarmed was shot dead by a white police officer for no reason whatsoever. And this rally is to support black lives mattering. So they go as a family. And you would think, yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. That's that's absolutely makes sense. You've got six, you know, black kids. This, of course, makes sense. Take them to this. So they watch the protest. And they, you know, they're they're there, they've got placards, and they're like, yep, okay, we're fully in support of this. Now, Devonte, he is 15, and he's feeling especially moved by the protest. And 15-year-old Devonte, the black teenager, he walks up to a white police officer, and he gives him a hug. And the officer hugs him back and a photographer snaps a picture. Devontae is looking into the camera and he is upset. He is very visibly upset. There are tears rolling down his face and the officer is just holding him. Now it's a powerful, powerful photograph. It's so powerful. You've maybe seen it. You maybe already know this photograph. It's so beautiful. At this Black Lives Matter rally, here you have this white officer. When they are under fire, here is this officer holding a crying teenager in his arms. Now, this picture. It is, it's one of these, like, you know, sign of the times... Um, iconic picture speaks a billion words all this kind of jazz and Devontae Hart is right at the centre of it so Jen and Sarah they are delighted because they're like he's made a historical moment because the photograph it goes global it's on Twitter before you know it It's on the front page of newspapers. For God's sake, it's on a Saturday night live sketch. It's massive. And they're going, that's our son. That's our Devontae, our special child. Calls were coming in for the Hart family to appear on TV shows and talk about their lives. I mean, I I suppose you can see the interest. The interest is, oh, you've got two lesbian mums raising kids. Brilliant. Let's, Let's talk about this. But Jen and Sarah, they refuse all of these offers. All of them. Which I find baffling. Here is the thing with the two of them that bloody... At this point in the story, I mean, I'm going to get way more fucking annoyed with them in a minute. But at this point, it annoys me. They're sort of slightly courting the attention. And then all, all of a sudden, they decide they don't want the attention. Well, make up your fucking mind. What is it you actually want? Like, the, you know, like the, they're really happy that Devontae is in this picture. And this picture is now huge all around the world. But yet, they don't want to do anything with that. They just want to keep that to themselves. Right, well this is difficult because, as I said, Jen Hart spends her entire time on Facebook posting images of the eight of them, all like holding signs that say things like, love is happiness, free hugs from the Hart family, we support love in this world, they're all doing the peace sign, they're all doing this, I mean, they're they're almost like... It's like she's sort of slightly courting a bit 
of that media attention. And yet when it comes, she decides she doesn't want it. Hmm. After the Devonte picture, Jen will begin to say that she's the target of abuse online. And that people are cruel about raising six kids of a different ethnicity. I mean, how much of that, again, is true, isn't known. Anyway, with that to supposedly be contending with, Jen and Sarah have got something else on their minds, and that is money. They aren't doing terribly well with money, and they've had to begin a debt remanagement programme. So they had a debt in the region of about $25,000 on credit cards. And they had the expense of the house that they lived in. Now, it wasn't a cheap house they lived in. It was nearly $400,000. So they were under a lot of financial stress. The same friend who remains anonymous and spoke about the kids being zombies, says that the last time she saw Jen was in 2012, and talking about her financial stress, she was possibly talking about moving the family to San Francisco. Well, if she's going to move them to San Francisco, she better remember to put flowers in their hair <laughs> honestly I make myself laugh so much <laughs> I need like a badoom at the end of that don't I <clears throat> right I'll record my own right ready badoom right I'll tell the joke again right I'll tell the joke again right and then I'll, I'll add my badoom at the end right she was talking about moving the family to San Francisco. If she moves them there, she better put flowers in their hair. Boom. Oh, see, it, it works so much better, doesn't it? It works so much better. <laughs> oh, but you know what? Moving to San Francisco doesn't happen. It's just another Jen idea. What does happen is this. They move the family to Washington. Without saying a goodbye to anybody, without telling authorities, they just up and they go to Washington. They get there and they don't bother to put the kids into school. They still keep all the photographs online, as always, that's what they like to do. So the heart troop have moved in to a new suburb of Washington and they have new neighbours. Of course, they have Dana and Bruce DeKalb. Now, they're both in their late 50s, this couple. They're nice people. They're grounded, lovely people. They've lived there an awfully long time and, of course, they're like... Ooh, we've got new neighbours. How exciting. Which is exactly the way that I am all the time. I was actually beside myself. I can't even talk about it. I'm so raging. Beside myself to realise that whilst I had been working away back at my house, <laughs> three weeks had passed. One set of neighbours had moved out. A new set of neighbours had moved in. Did I know about this? No. Did I fuck? I was livid the day that I saw a new a man walking down the pathway. And I was like, who's he? Who's this? What's going on here? And I suddenly worked it out. I was like, oh my God, there's new neighbours. 
How did I not know? They've been here three weeks. How do I not know everything about them already? I want to know their names. I want to know their jobs. I want to know everything about them. Three weeks had passed. Fucking livid. Still don't know anything about them because they're weirdos and they won't talk. As much as my... I mean, my skills at getting people to chat are good. I'm like, hi, how are you? (laughs) Nothing. Getting nothing back. Raging. Yeah. So I I, I feel the the pain of uh, Dana... And Bruce, who've got new neighbours, and they're like, here, man, new neighbours. I want to know about them. But here's the thing. There's no chance to see their new neighbours, because they never see the kids outside. The kids don't play outside. And in the house, the blinds are down all of the time. So the Hart family, they're living there for a year. The neighbours still don't get to see who really lives next door to them. Now they get the odd glimpse, right? So they'll see the kids here and there go in and out and they think, right, how many, how many kids are living next door? We can't really tell. They'll sometimes see Sarah coming and going. They occasionally get a glimpse of Jen. But it's all very cloak and dagger. They can't really get a handle on what this is. So, one day, Dana, the neighbour, is standing in her driveway. She's just about to get into her car. And a teenage boy walks up to her. And it's... Devonte. Now, as he's talking to her, he's looking behind him all the time. He's stressed. Dana can see that he's really, really stressed. And he says, please, can you give me some food? Specifically, can you give me tortillas? Now, Dana thinking, okay, Maybe this is just a neighbourly sort of lend me some sugar. She gives him tortillas. It plays on her mind and she thinks, that's really odd that that happened. And she already thinks this situation over here is a bit weird, but you know, she just lets it go. The following day, Devonte is back. He says, don't tell my mums, but I need anything you can give me to eat. I need food for my brothers and sisters. And Dana asks him, why? What's wrong? He says, please don't say anything. Any food that you have, anything at all, please give us it. We will take anything you've got. And Dana says, okay, I'll I'll give you food. I'll give you whatever I can. Over the next few weeks, they agree with Devonte that they will leave a sealed box of food at the back of their yard for the kids to eat. And Devonte says, you must make sure it's hidden. Make sure that my mums do not know that this food exists. They cannot know about it. And Dana says, of course, I'll fill it with Meat, I'll fill it with sweets, I'll fill it with bread, I'll fill it with everything and I'll hide it in the back of the garden and you go and get it. But she also says to him, tell me why I have to do this. And he says, you can't ask me questions about it. Don't ask me to talk about why I need to get food for my brother's and my sisters. So Dana, like, 
any of us would be, she is beside herself with worry. And she says to her husband, Bruce, right, we have to call protection services. We have to. Bruce says at this point, I think it's best that we just keep a note of all the conversations we're having with Devontae. Keep a note of the fact that we are burying food in the back door for them to find. And we'll just, we'll just keep a note of it. This is about to change. Bruce is about to go from, let's keep a note of it, to something else entirely. Remember where this all started. Bruce hears a noise at the door and it's 1.30am. And he thinks, was it the wind? Was it an animal? And then the noise at the door is more frantic. He opens it and it's Hannah, one of the heart daughters, the one who had bruises at school. When Bruce opens the door, Hannah is screaming, help me, help. She's running up the stairs past him into his house and she's screaming please don't let them in they are racists they abuse us she goes upstairs and between a bed and a wardrobe she curls herself up into a tiny ball so when i said earlier that a second female entered that house. It was Jen Hart. She runs upstairs. She grabs Hannah. She marches her past Bruce. And she says, you have got to tell these people that you are sorry. Hannah replies, yes ma'am. Jen says, you have got to tell these people, you are just having a bad week. Hannah replies, yes ma'am. And she marches Hannah out of the home. Now, Dana and Bruce are obviously shocked to the absolute core. They're like, what the fuck do we do? So now they're thinking, right, we have to call someone. We have to call Child Protection Services. I mean, I'm not judging this couple in any way whatsoever because you can't judge situation to situation. I would have called them way before now. I would have called them way before now, but okay, each to your own. You make your decisions. You do what you do. You can't judge the things that people do in the moment. But right now, right now, in front of them is a situation where literally a fucking child has come into their home and said, please, I need to get away from these people. They're racists and they hit us. That's time to do something. But before they can even wake up the next morning and actually do anything about it, at 9am there is a knock on the door. They go, they answer it. And standing on their doorstep is the entire Hart family. The entire clan. So you've got Jen, you've got Sarah, and you've got the six kids. And Jen says, We're here to apologise about the disturbance last night. Let us explain. It's been a really tough week in our house because, sadly, we've had the death of a couple of animals. And so the kids are a bit upset. Now, Dana will say, as she is looking at all of the six kids, they all seem to have a sort of frozen, painted-on 
smile on their face and she's a bit creeped out by what that whole thing is. Now, at the very front of this eight <laughs> group of eight people standing on the doorstep is little Hannah. Hannah, the one who had run in the night before. And Jen says to her, go on, read the note, Hannah. Read the note that you have written for Dana and Bruce. Go on, read it, read it. So, little Hannah pulls out a piece of paper and it's like a sort of just like half a sheet of A4 and there's like green handwriting on it. And the note that Hannah has says this. Dear Dana Bruce, I stopped this morning because I feel awful about disturbing your peace and worrying you in the middle of the night. I was very frustrated with my brother and I didn't handle things very maturely. And I'm sorry for telling lies to get attention. I'm working to be more honest and finding better ways to communicate my frustrations. I've been very sad about two of our cats dying recently, so I was just very sad and frustrated last night. Thank you for being kind. Hannah. Now, Dana and Bruce, they let Hannah read this note. And it's at this point, this couple, I mean, this couple are great because they're just like, hmm, this is all fucking shades of wrong. We're not buying this for a fucking second. What are you even talking about here? They say, right, that's fine. Thank you for the apology notes. But they almost indicate we're not really buying it. We don't we don't really believe it. Like what's happened here? Like what something's weird. Why are your kids coming and asking us for food? Now this is the first Jen and Sarah have ever heard of their kids coming to ask for food. But Jen, quick as a fucking whippet, is straight off the back. And she says this, and it makes me so mad that this is the term she uses. She says, look, our kids were crack babies. So, they have no boundaries with things like food. They don't understand how food works. And Dana says, okay, but they're a bit older, you know, than babies. So surely they do understand it. And Jen, of course, reverts to, well, you wouldn't understand what it's like to raise kids who've, you know, come from mothers who had substance abuses. You just wouldn't understand that. And Jen and Sarah, they get a bit defensive at this point about everyone wants to attack them, everyone hates them, everyone's against them. And Dana and Bruce are like, why? Like, we're your neighbours, like, we would, you know, support you fully, like, in any way that you wanted, but why do you think everyone's against you? And Jen says, hello, we are a lesbian couple raising six black kids. You tell me how you think society is going to look at us. And Dana and Bruce are a bit like, well, we're not, we're not the whole of society, and we're actually fine with the situation. So, they leave. The Hart family go back into their house. And Dana and Bruce are left with an even worse feeling now. Because they're like, this is just adding up to all shades of wrong. So, here's what Dana and Bruce do. They ask for a welfare check to happen on the Hart family. And it does. So, someone from Child Protection Services comes to check 
on the family. Now it's the middle of the day. The kids should be at home. They're not in school. Jen should be at home. The officer who comes to check, she sees activity inside of the house. And the minute she knocks on the door, all activity stops. And the door is never answered. She knocks again. Silence from inside the house. And she knows there's people inside of it. She knows that Jen and the kids are inside the house, but no silence. Dana and Bruce, they decide we're not happy with that. We don't want that situation. No, it's not It's not good enough. It's not good enough that they just didn't answer the door. So they keep calling Child Protection Services and saying, can you come out again, please, and do another check? Because it's really necessary. There are 10, yes, 10 visits to the Hart family home. Now, on one of these visits, and it's towards the later end of it, because they just keep avoiding it, they just keep not answering the door, towards, like, visit 8 or 9, eventually they get inside. And Child Protection Services get to speak to the kids now. When they get to speak to them, what do the kids say? They say, We are treated really well by our parents. Our mums love us. They give us food. They play games. They teach us. We have a lovely family home. And it's the same answer from every child to an almost scripted level. Fuck's sake. How much do you, right now, as a listener to this story, want to be a neighbour to that as well? Because I know I do. I want to be a neighbour who can actually go and do something. And I know that Dana and Bruce, God bless them, they're doing their absolute best that they can. Short of literally going around there and dragging those kids out of that house. Like, I don't know... What else you could do? I mean, I don't know. I'm <laughs> I'm saying that like, what would you do if you were a neighbour? I don't know what I would do if I was a neighbour, but I just know that I would, oh, I'd want to do something. I just need to, I would need to just get my hands on that situation. I mean, Jen and Sarah, their answer to these child protection services are always the same. They say, no one understands our kids. She keeps coming back. Jen keeps coming back to crack babies as the, as the answer for everything. Oh, it's just awful. Sometimes when the child services are in, they will say, look, we've had like reports from the school that say things like, it might be possible that Jeremiah, who's the oldest of the sons, it might be possible that Jeremiah has autism. And they say, nonsense. Absolute nonsense. There is no way he has autism. Forget it. Child Protection Services also produced to the Hart family a document, and it's from a school doctor who has looked at all six of the Hart children and said they're all stunted in their growth. None of them are nourished correctly. They're all underweight. They're all under the height that they should be at. Like, something isn't right. Jen and Sarah, they say, this is ridiculous. This is because they they are crack babies. They come from mothers who had substance abuse. This is nothing to do with us. A bad feeling around the Hart family begins to spread. And so all of this thing that, you know, Jen thinks that she's posting all these wonderful things on Facebook it begins to kind of come back and bite her on the arse. And it comes, first of all, in the form of the photograph of Devonte hugging the police officer. You know, the photograph that was seen 
all around the world and was so incredibly, incredibly important. And it was their child and it was this moment and it was Black Lives Matter. Yeah, there's a photographer there who says, yeah, that was staged entirely, that photograph. It was utterly staged. This photographer says, I watched those two women, I watched Jen and Sarah Hart take Devonte aside minutes before that was taken and they shouted in his face. They screamed at him until he was hysterical and then they pushed him into the arms of the police officer and made sure that photograph was taken. <sighs> so, the 10 visits have happened and Child Protection Services are yet to act. They are yet to do anything. The Hart family essentially go into hiding for a few weeks. No one sees them. The blinds are down in the house. Until. They're spotted by the neighbour. Piling in to the family SUV. At midnight on March the 24th, 2018. The family get into the car and with Jen in the driver's seat they start to drive searches on Sarah's phone at the time will show she searched his death by drowning relatively painless She searched on Google, how much Benadryl does it take to knock out a 150 pound woman? How easy is it to overdose on over-the-counter medications? The Hart family in their car drive for hours for hours and hours Jen drives the family around Sarah ends up in the back seat of the family car on March 24th 2018 Jen drives the family to Warts a cliff overlooking the sea in California. The black box inside the car which registers its movements will show that she approached the edge of the cliff at a great speed and then stopped and then the car reversed she reversed the car and then at 70 miles an hour she drove the family SUV with her Sarah and the Hart family inside over the edge of the cliff. An hour after the car had plunged off the cliff, police were alerted and a massive full scale police ambulance operation began but it was too late 
The car lay at the bottom of the cliff, upturned. Inside the car lay the dead bodies of Jen Hart and Sarah Hart and the bodies of Marcus, 19, Jeremiah, 14, Abigail, 14 and Sierra, 12. They were all dead. Now, the bodies of Hannah and Devonte weren't there. So as police began to pick through the absolute fucking horror that was this site, they could find Jen and Sarah, four of the kids, but they couldn't find Hannah or Devonte. So, the search began to try and find those bodies. And to just understand what the mess here was, what the fuck had actually happened. So... They start to search and they can't find Hannah. Was she not in the car? Was Devonte not in the car? They're confused. They don't seem to be with their brothers and sisters in the car that went over the cliff. So where are they? A day into their searching, they find Hannah's foot lying in an area close to where the car had gone over the cliff. Slowly bits of Hannah's body begin to emerge from the water. And they can piece together that she was also in the car but must have been thrown from the car into the water. However, where is Devonte? The son, the favourite son of Jane and Sarah. Well, there's no evidence of his body. There's no bits of him that wash up in the water, nothing. So when police register this, they have to register as seven deaths. Jen, Sarah and the five children they now know about, but where is Devonte? To this day, Devonte Hart is still considered missing because no sign of him has ever shown up. And this just leads to more and more questions. The questions that are asked are, and I think they're viable, I think they're actually dead viable questions. Did Jane and Sarah set out knowing that they were about to drive off a cliff, kill their entire family, and did they choose to save him, their favourite, from this? Or has Devontae's body just never been discovered? A massive police search begins for his body. Police start to search the family home. They start to search the grounds of their house. 
they ask neighbours, have you seen him? Do you know where he is? No, no one's got an answer. This happened two years ago and Devonte Hart has never been seen. No one knows if he's alive, if he's dead, where he is, what's happening. It can only be assumed that he was also in that car that drove over that cliff. Because otherwise Devonte is somewhere in the world and no one knows where. Toxicology reports will show that Jen Hart was five times over the legal alcohol limit for driving. And when people hear this about her, they say, it's just the strangest thing because she didn't drink alcohol ever. She just wasn't a drinker. She just never went near alcohol. So the assumption becomes then she knew what she was about to do with her family and she was drinking to raise the courage. Sarah's body was discovered through the toxicology report to have contained a lot of Benadryl. She had drugged herself for that car journey. Some of the kids showed in their toxicology reports that they had also been drugged with Benadryl by Sarah or by Jane or by somebody. To this day, no one will understand what drove Jane Hart and Sarah Hart to pack their family into a car and drive off a cliff. What pressure they must have been under or what a pressure they perceived that they were under or what had they been hiding for years and what did they know they could no longer be hiding. I think it's really easy in a story like this to look for someone to blame or look for the person that you think is the one who's in charge of it. I don't know with Jen and Sarah Hart. It's They're so wrapped up in mystery. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. People will be telling this story on podcasts in years to come because... More and more things will come out about them. Perhaps, perhaps Devontae Hart is out there somewhere and there's a story to be told there. I don't know. But I don't think, you know, this is a recent story. This only happened, you know, last year. And there is there is more to know about them. There's details all the time coming out about them. And I think maybe... At the moment, maybe the way I've told it, maybe the way that I've read it, maybe the way I've understood it, maybe the way I've processed the story, it seems to me like Jen Hart is the driver of this whole story. I don't know, maybe she's not. Maybe there was something else going on. It, you know what, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter right now. What matters is that those two women were given the most incredible opportunity. They got six beautiful kids in their life. I would fucking bite your arm off to have six kids in my life right now. I really fucking would. So, to then drive them off a cliff to their death is just not something I can understand right now 
in time, maybe I can understand it. Right now, no, I can't. But I will always be open to understanding that, yes, mental health plays a huge part. Pressure plays a huge part in people's lives. And so, I don't really know how... I, you, know, you know the weirdest thing about this is? I normally always know... No, in fact, not even normally. <laughs> I always know how to end a story. I always know how to end a story. I don't know how to end it with this one. Because I really feel... I don't know. I just feel lots of things. I just feel really like... Oh, the fuck? Yeah. I can only end the story... And to end the podcast, because otherwise you'd be listening to <laughs> another three hours of me warbling on, and you don't want that. But I can only end it really by saying I don't understand what happened the day that they packed their kids into that car and ended up by driving them off a cliff to their death. I don't get that. But what I will say is this. I hope that Devonte is out there somewhere and we might one day know the story. And those kids who died in the back of that car, God bless you. And I'm sorry that you ever were adopted by Jane and Sarah Hart. And so ends the story. Alright then, so, <laughs> yeah, a dark one, a tough one, but you know what, it can't all be light, it can't all be something else, it has to just be that sometimes, because that's life, that's life. <laughs> Alrighty, so, um, yeah, I'll just sign off by saying, as always, thank you for listening it's been a chunky one this one it's it's uh, gone on a bit so if you're if you're still with me give me a holler yeah what i will say is this you can if you like extraordinary stories podcast you can help me out and how you can do it is you can leave me a review now these are not i've said it before they're not for my vanity right they're not i don't care right Say what you like, write what you like. They're for visibility of the podcast, and it's so boring. But this is how it happens, right? Like, people know about podcasts because they get reviews on iTunes or they get reviews on whatever, blah, 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 blah. And that's how these things. Now, I hate that that's the system. I hate that that's how it works. I'd rather be like one of these, like, word of mouth podcasts that people are like, oh my god, have you heard this? Have you heard the Extraordinary Story podcast? You're going to love it. You know, the system doesn't really work like that. You have to just kind of trust that, that you know, I would love it. I would bloody love it. If that's how it worked, it's not going to happen. What has to happen is there has to be reviews. So, I'm asking you to leave one, if you could. Now, I know we don't all use Apple. No, of course we don't. Everyone doesn't use it, but just leave me a review wherever you can. If you can't be arsed to do that, I mean, I completely understand if you cannot be arsed. Because sometimes podcasts are needy. Sometimes podcasts are like, do you know what, mate? Just while you listen to a podcast, stop asking me to fucking do stuff. I get that, right? I get that. <laughs> so if you don't want to do it, then just, I hope you liked listening. And, um, great. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, brilliant. Right, I'm going to get out of here because I'm just starting to babble. I can hear myself. I'm going into babble mode. <laughs> and nobody wants babble mode. So, thank you for listening. Until the next episode. Okay. 
Goodbye. It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine from the look on his face. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.